All right. Thanks, everybody. So we've got two more presentations for day one. And tonight, I believe you've got your networking dinner at Crocosaurus Cove. Uh, for some of our interstaters who might not have been to Crocosaurus Cove before, you're going to have an amazing time. There's nothing like eating your dinner next to something that could eat you as well. It's, it's really great to make you feel humble and in, insignificant. It's, it's a good choice. Uh, make sure that you don't get too close to the crocodiles. I want to see you here tomorrow with all of your limbs. That would be excellent. So two more presentations in the afternoon session, legends. Our first one is about packaging waste collection and processing in remote and regional areas. It's being presented by Peter Brisbane from the Go Government Partnership Manager from the Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation. Um, is that APCO as an acronym? Yep, great. From APCO, everybody. So can I please get you to put your hands together and welcome Peter Brisbane. Uh, hi there, everybody. Um, it's very nice to be here. Um, We've probably heard a little bit about APCO today, so it's a little bit um, bit of a challenge to stand up in front of what may not be the world's least uh, sceptical organisation about APCO and about product stewardship more broadly. Uh, but that's a conversation that needs to be had uh, nationally, so I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of that conversation. Forward, forward, forward. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about what APCO's role is and the National Waste Policy Action Plan because we actually have some responsibilities under the National Waste Policy Action Plan and I'm pleased that um, we've already heard quite a bit about that plan today and that it is generally seen as a good thing. That's really positive. Uh, I'm going to talk about packaging waste collection and processing options in remote and regional areas. Uh, and I know that there's even a bit of cynicism about the ability or scepticism, I suppose is a better word, about the ability to actually have an impact on packaging waste collection in remote and regional areas. And I think that's that's reasonable. There's a lot of challenges there that we've got to work through. Uh, and then about the opportunities that we're looking at at the moment. Uh, so first of all, APCO's role. So we've talked a little bit about product stewardship today, and I know that Rose Reed is going to be here from the Product Stewardship Centre of Excellence tomorrow to talk more about product stewardship. But just to give some sense of the sort of uh, legislative frameworks that are in place nationally uh, and how APCO fits into those. So we actually have three different acts that deal with product stewardship. We have the National Environment Protection Council Act 1994. That's the oldest one. Uh, it, that was around before the time that the Commonwealth really knew that it could legislate in relation to um, environmental matters. Uh, and so it's a strange act that's it's made by the Commonwealth, but it's picked up in all the states and territories. The Australian Packaging Covenant is under the National Environment Protection Council Act. Uh, and so it, it's, it's a national agreement that's also an agreement by all of the states and territories with industry. It's kind of voluntary and yet it's kind of mandatory at the same time. So uh, it's one of those things that Natasha would have found quite difficult to deal with uh, in, the, in the dissertation that she uh, talked about. Uh, there's a little bit of scepticism, I suppose, about what the covenant uh, can achieve in that sort of environment. I say it's voluntary, but also mandatory. Companies have an obligation to be part of a product stewardship scheme on packaging in Australia. And I did mention this morning that some states, New South Wales, for example, uh, have mandatory recycling targets for packaging. So companies can choose either to meet those mandatory targets in different states and territories. In New South Wales, it's 80%. Uh, in Queensland, they have differentiated targets for different types of packaging materials. In Victoria, it's a 70% recycling target. They can either do that or they can join the Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation. We have 1,500 members who have joined the Packaging Covenant Organisation. There's probably a lot more than that who haven't joined the Covenant uh, that should be regulated by states and territories, but in fact, there's no enforcement of any of those regulations. Uh, and in fact, the Northern Territory is the only jurisdiction that doesn't have any legislation in relation to the uh, submissions, which is uh, unfortunate. But um, it is being reviewed at the moment, uh, and what we're hoping for is that um, it will actually be tightened up. And so that non-compliance that we see in relation to those companies uh, will actually be fixed up. Uh, then there was the uh, Product Stewardship Oil Act that was also mentioned this morning as being something more of a mandatory scheme. Uh, it's a very good model. Uh, and then the Recycling and Waste Reduction Act 2020. And I think somebody this morning, it might have been Gail, was talking about, wouldn't it be nice if the packaging covenant was picked up and put under that piece of Commonwealth legislation? That would certainly be administratively easier uh, and it might make compliance and enforcement easier, but it's up to governments to decide what they want to do. Uh, so APCO doesn't make any judgment about whether mandatory targets would be better than voluntary targets. Uh, we've gone through a process over the past four years of working out um, what actually needs to be done to set and uh, get industry engaged and achieve targets. Uh, we feel that that work would be the same whether it's mandatory or voluntary. It would just, in some cases, be a little bit easier to do things under a mandatory scheme. 
particularly getting companies to do what you want them to do. That would be easier, for example. Um, so what is APCO? We're an independent organisation that's been established to implement the Australian Packaging Covenant. And as I said, that's an agreement between governments, the Commonwealth and all the states and territories, uh, and industry about how industry will go about mitigating the environmental impacts of packaging. Uh, we sort of, um, it, because we don't have regulatory authority, we've got to find out some way of getting companies to do what we want them to do. Uh, and so a lot of companies expect us to deliver value to them. We do deliver programs to them. We provide them with the Australia's Recycling Label, which is an on-pack labelling scheme that actually tells consumers which bin to put a piece of packaging in. So I was talking with somebody this morning about if you look at something like a meat tray, it may have a one on it, and you think, oh, that's PET, that can be recycled. But actually, that's only telling you about what the base material is that that meat tray is made out of. There may actually be a laminar layer on that uh, PET that stops it from being recognised by the optical uh, sorters uh, in, a, in a MRF, and so it's going to end up in landfill. Uh, and so what the Australasian Recycling Label does, it's, it's an evidence-based system. You've got to enter all of the parameters of your packaging into this system, so that is not only what the, the base layer is, so it's PET, but what the laminar layers are that go on top of the PET, uh, the size of the label, the glues that are used in the label, uh, any dyes that are used in the plastic, all of those sorts of things, and that will tell you whether or not it's recyclable. So that's what the Australian Recycling Label does. Uh, we also have um, guidance materials for um, uh, designer packaging, so there's been a lot of talk today about designer packaging. Uh, it is actually a huge job to get companies to design packaging that's more recyclable. And so we've been uh, engaged in this job now for a couple of years. We're starting to make some progress in that direction. Um, but there's still a lot, of, well, a lot of work to do, obviously. So we provide a lot of technical guidance about what is recyclable and what's not recyclable. Uh, and if companies are going to make packaging that's not recyclable, then what we expect is that they will be putting in place collection si uh, systems and uh, recycling programs. Uh, to actually make sure that that material gets properly reused and it has an end-of-life uh, value as well. Uh, but that's a big job as well. Some of you will be familiar with the Red Cycle program. Uh, so soft plastics can't go through curbside anywhere around the country. Uh, there have been a few trials of, of collecting soft plastic through curbside, but not very widespread. Um, so the Red Cycle program provides for people to take those back to Coles and Woolworths. It's currently only collecting about 1% of the soft plastics around the country, so very small, but that's the sort of starting program, and that's the sort of effort that we expect companies to make, only on a much grander scale over the next few years. Uh, we have in place national packaging targets, which some of you will be familiar with. I don't think I have a slide of them. But basically, we require, all, by 2025, all packaging to be recyclable, compostable, or reusable. Uh, we require 70% recycling of plastic packaging. Currently, we're at uh, 18%. I think it was a couple of years ago, 14%. So we're on the way up, but there's still a huge uh, gap to make up there. Um, we have a target of phasing out problematic and unnecessary single-use plastic packaging by 2025, and so we have a series of packaging materials that we have identified that need to be phased out. Um, and we're supporting uh, the Commonwealth in the implementation of its National Plastics Plan phase out of expanded polystyrene, for example. Uh, and we have a target of 50% of packaging materials being comprised of recycled materials by 2025. There's a lot of talk about whether or not those targets should be made mandatory in relation to the current, re current review. And as I said, APCO doesn't mind either way. Quite frankly, if governments want to make them mandatory, uh, that would make our job easier. Uh, so a co-regulatory model, I've, I've sort of covered this. We have state and federal governments. Uh, we have our members who are, everybody, everybody in the packaging supply chain is required to be a member. If you manufacture packaging, if you sell goods in, in packaging, uh, if you're a retailer that sells packaged products, then you're required to be either a member of the packaging covenant uh, or to meet the targets that state and territories establish for you. Uh, and then we have a group of stakeholders, so other industry players, uh, and it's all under the Australian Packaging Covenant, which is a written agreement that, that prescribes what it is that APCO needs to do to deliver on that. Oh, the packaging targets, I've already talked through what those are. Uh, so actually, the value of the packaging targets is that they're... They are based on targets that have been developed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which we've heard a bit about today. We work quite closely with the Ellen MacArthur, with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. The value of working internationally with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is that our big members, and they're companies like APCO, oh, sorry, not APCO, uh, Nestle, Unilever, um, the big beverage companies, the, the big consumer products companies, they're all establishing these sorts of targets, these internal targets globally, uh, and, and working to achieve them globally. So it's made it a lot easier to work with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation because that means that everybody's 
globally working to the same sorts of targets. Uh, it also makes, us, makes it possible to use that global coverage to leverage um, the sorts of changes that we need to see in markets where they manufacture packaging, uh, like China and, and other markets that aren't necessarily working to achieve these same targets. But if all of their main customers are globally, then we start to have a bit of leverage that we don't otherwise get uh, just working alone in Australia. Uh, so we work with a collective impact framework. So this recognises that um, we can get our members to make changes to the design of packaging, or we, that, that's one thing that we can try to do. We can educate them to do that. Uh, but we don't hold all the levers in terms of, um, we don't hold regulatory levers. So we need to work with state and territory governments and the Commonwealth. Uh, and even local governments in some cases, Hobart City Council, for example, has banned some single-use plastics, uh, to, um, uh, governments need to use their regulatory levers. Um, the waste and recycling industry has a key role to play, obviously, in terms of um, the sorts of standards that they can develop and put in place for, for MRFs and collections and, and end, end materials that come out of that, that process. Basically, we need to work with everybody across the supply chain, governments and industry, to get this happening. Uh, we can't, and our members can't do it alone. Uh, so under our collective impact framework, we have three particular outcomes. One is about design of packaging. The second is about making sure that we have uh, the right sorts of collection systems and recycling systems in place, and the right sorts of education for the consumers in, in terms of how they use that. And I talk about the Australian recycling label in terms of getting people to um, um, use the right recycling bin and all of those sorts of things. Uh, and then the third outcome is about making sure that there are end markets for the recycled materials. And so partly that's about the target that we have set in relation to packaging, which is 50% of packaging being made of recycled materials by 2025. But it's also about working with other people who have opportunities to use recycled materials. Uh, we work with a bunch of different companies that uh, are looking at um, utilisation of plastic in um, road construction, for example, and other civil infrastructure. Uh, but in relation to our second outcome, improved collection and recycling systems, that's what we're seeing as particularly relevant in relation to remote and regional areas. And I will get on to remote and regional areas very soon. So that is about standardising curbside collection systems. And so there's a lot of work happening in different states and territories at the moment about standardisation of materials. It's actually quite difficult to standardise uh, the collection of materials, even within a, a relatively small group of councils. Each council is collecting a slightly different uh, set of materials. Each MRF is accepting a slightly different set of materials. So to, for us to tell packaging companies, you need to design to, to suit the specifications of different councils and different um, MRFs is actually a bit of a challenge. Ideally, there would just be one set of materials that would be collected and one set of materials that would be designed and they would correspond. So it's actually quite challenging. Uh, expanding drop-off and take-back systems for packaging. So if it's not going to go on curbside, where is it going to go? And that's something that we are placing the emphasis on industry to identify those pathways. Where are those materials going to go if they're not going to go through curbside? Uh, improve the infrastructure for sortation and recycling. And this is one where we don't really hold the levers. It's up, actually really up to governments and the industry to invest together uh, and to educate households and businesses to source separate effectively. And that's one thing where we feel that we are making the difference because we have the Australian recycling label. Um, probably lots of you have seen the Australasian recycling label. You may not know that you are seeing it, but it's, it's there. It's little, um, uh, little symbols that tell you for each component of the packaging, which bin to put it in. Uh, the National Plastics Plan has set a target of 80% of supermarket products having the Australasian recycling label on them by 2023, uh, which would be a significant step forward. Um, but by 2025, our view is that all packaging, all the packaging of our members, and that really should be all packaging on the market, will need to have the Australasian recycling label. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot more difficult to achieve, particularly the 70% recycling of plastic. Forward. Hmm. Do excuse me, the... Uh, oh, there we go. So the National, Pol uh, National Waste Policy Action Plan uh, we've talked a fair bit about it today. Uh, APCO, because a lot of what we do is focused on packaging design, we're aware that, that it's fantastic if, uh, at a sort of macro level and achieving targets, you know, even if it's a, a massive target like 70% plastics recycling, that really benefits metropolitan areas or inner regional areas a great deal. Uh, but it doesn't have such an impact on areas that don't have curbside recycling. Uh, and that have other challenges in relation to packaging, waste collection and recycling. 
Uh, so one of the principles, the, the packaging covenant was redesigned in 2016 and, and the new one started in, the, in 2017. One of the principles in its redesign was that the work of the covenant should have a, a benefit uh, for all of Australia, not just metropolitan areas or in regional areas. Uh, and so we've tried to work out how is it that we go about delivering some sort of benefit in remote and regional areas. Um, because things like the Australasian recycling label are not going to have a huge impact. So when we were working with government to, uh, on the National Waste Policy Action Plan, we were part of the, 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 the reference group, the industry reference group. Uh, we had two um, outcomes written in, or two actions written in, that APCO was going to ta is taking responsibility for. 3.14 is to report on opportunities to promote regional collection and recycling of soft plastics through expansion of the regional model for soft plastics. The wording is a little bit funny. We don't need to worry too much about that. It's partly historical where these, uh, where these sentences came from. But basically, it's about let's find a solution for soft plastics that's work that works in remote and regional areas. Uh, and the second was to develop shared infrastructure and collection processes for packaging waste in remote and regional areas through a waste collection partnership. And so that is about identifying the sorts of partners that we can work with um, that will actually sort of uh, encourage industry to get more involved. So when I talk about industry, I'm not really talking about the waste industry. I'm talking about the, the, the producers of the waste, as Gail would have called them this morning, uh, the companies, the brand owners and the retailers, the people who are actually putting stuff on the market. What is going to encourage them to get involved in this work? And that is got to work through partners, partnerships. And so that's uh, what 315 is all about. Uh, so we've been talking with government, particularly the Commonwealth, about how we are to deliver on these things uh, over the next few years. And so that brings me to packaging waste collection and processing options in remote and regional areas. So the issue is uh, most of Australia's population lives uh, around the edges, uh, in the major cities uh, and in inner regional areas. Uh, only 10.5% live in outer regional, remote and very remote areas. And I know that this is all second nature to you because this is the, your reality. We estimate, or our consultants estimated, that there was around 220,000 tonnes of packaging waste in outer regional and remote areas. So it's not, it's not huge in terms of the overall packaging material flow in Australia, which is about five, five and a half, somewhere between five and a half and six million tonnes a year. And so we could actually achieve those targets without worrying about it. And that's part of the problem with product stewardship, that because of the distances and the cost of doing business in remote and regional areas, it just doesn't happen as, mu as much. It's fantastic to see organisations like Tire Stewardship Australia working here, and, and I know that TVs and computers are collected and those sorts of things, but generally the service is less in, in uh, remote and regional areas. Uh, but 20, 222,000 tonnes, we think that there must be some value in, um, in collecting that and making sure that there's service delivery around uh, other parts of the country. Uh, and as I said there at the bottom, product stewardship is less effective in remote and regional areas, and that's something that we want to address. Uh, so the current landscape, uh, as you will know, as we get further away from the, the metropolitan areas to outer regional remote and very remote, basically packaging waste collection, transportation, recycling and end markets happen very rarely or not at all. Uh, so even though coming here, you will all know about these problems. And, and when we talk to people, everybody knows intuitively what the problems are. What we found was that there wasn't a really um, a comprehensive listing of these problems. Nobody had really made an effort, uh, probably since the first National Waste Policy Action Plan, which was, was I think about 2010. Nobody had really made an effort to write down what are the problems, what are the challenges, and how, do, how might we start to overcome those challenges, and particularly in relation to packaging waste. Uh, so what we did in 2020 was that we um, went through a process of talking with people who work in remote and regional areas and state governments and local government associations uh, and industry and we got some of our members involved and started talking through what are the problems and um, uh, we looked at 23 case studies, some of them were in the Northern Territory, uh, really short case studies but basically talking about the sorts of things that have been done in remote and regional areas, whether they worked or whether they didn't work. In some cases they were quite good, in some cases uh, for example, there was, an exa there was a, um, a case study of a, a program in New South Wales where somebody had bought, a, a council had bought, or a group of councils had bought a mobile glass crusher. And the plan was to drive around different council areas and crush each uh, council's glass uh, consecutively. Uh, but that mobile glass crusher had ended up sitting in a local government area uh, just in a yard disused for about the past five years. So there are a whole lot of examples where things have worked really well 
uh, one of the case studies that was really good was um, East Arnhem uh, participating in the Northern Territory Container Deposit Scheme uh, and engaging the local community in, in collecting bottles and then using reverse logistics through C-SWIFT to extract those bottles um, or those beverage containers out of there. Uh, that was successful, uh, unlike the glass crusher one. So just talking with uh, some state governments recently, like uh, the Victorian government, for example, not remote and regional area, but um, you would think it would be easier for them because of the metropolitan and inner regional nature of Victoria. They're looking at how to, how to standardise curbside collections across Victoria. And they're looking at a whole range of different materials. And I know that there's been a whole, and they know that there's been a whole lot of different trials in different local government areas in Victoria of, of trialing different materials, excluding some materials, including other materials and these sorts of things. But nobody actually has a list of all of those trials uh, and uh, what the outcomes of those trials were. So they sit down to do a, a statewide analysis of curbside and they don't actually have the evidence of, of, that's been collected over the past decade or so on what works and what doesn't in Victoria. So if Victoria can't get that right, then imagine what it's like looking across the, uh, across the continent uh, in remote and regional areas. There just hasn't been any sort of record keeping. Uh, so what we did was we looked at current programs and approaches, gaps and challenges, and identified opportunities across the following five areas. Uh, capability development, planning and governance. So it's, if you look at those other four, packaging, waste collection, transportation, recycling and end markets, that's basically stepping through the, the, the supply chain, I suppose, of, of the waste collection and recycling and end use um, process. But then the other one that we identified, capability development, planning and governance, recognised that it's very difficult to solve those other problems unless you have that sort of strategic level management in place. And that that's really difficult over such a wide area where you have staff turnover and um, you know not the capability to to manage infrastructure and, and all of those sorts of things you don't have the relationships in, in in place across different areas to make things work in terms of um, aggregation of volumes and those sorts of things it's much easier to do in in metropolitan areas uh, so just looking through what are some of the gaps and challenges that were identified through the process starting with packaging waste collection as, as the most fundamental thing that we would like to see happen or we would like to work with people to make happen. Uh, and, and, and as we go through this, I don't want to talk through them all in detail. I've just highlighted some of the ones that are particularly relevant to the process that we're going through at the moment. And I will tell you what that process is uh, when I get towards the end. Uh, first of all, inconsistent coverage of product stewardship schemes and other programs and approaches. Uh, duh, everybody knows that. Um, not all packaging is covered by existing collection programs. And so there are some fantastic examples of collection programs, but they're only collecting certain materials. Beverage container deposit schemes, for example, doing a great job of beverage containers, but not collecting other things. But there is an opportunity that that creates because you've already got a collection network and a transportation network and those sorts of things. Um, small volumes, not economically viable. Everybody knows that. Uh, reliance on external funding to maintain collection programs. Uh, and so that's a bit of a challenge that we need to work through. And we are talking with government, how do we solve that sort of problem? Uh, and then the absence of industry partners in some areas, e.g. Coles and Woolworths to provide red cycle. So it, it, even just the absence of some of these large companies actually makes it difficult to identify who is going to fill the void in remote and regional areas. Transportation, um, really obvious, high cost per tonne of waste transported due to the long distances. Uh, again, reliance on external funding. Uh, and despite some successful examples, and this came up this morning, despite some successful examples, there isn't widespread use to, uh, of um, reverse logistics. It seems obvious that you should use it, but the, it seems that the people that we've talked to about reverse logistics actually find it really difficult. Uh, there was one of our large members that we spoke to about a particular example. Uh, they, they are a retailer. They had, um, you know, um, when CDs uh, and um, CD-ROMs and all those sorts of things went out of fashion and, and people stopped buying them, they had a whole stack of those uh, plastic CD covers and they couldn't sell them, so they needed to get rid of them. And they wanted to have them recycled. Um, so the sustainability manager was tasked with finding a solution for them. And the only solution that he could come up with was involving transport costs that would actually... Um, uh, damage the bottom line of the company. Uh, so they may as well just go to landfill because that was cheaper. Uh, but he didn't want that to happen and he couldn't, he, he couldn't justify the cost upwards. So he spent quite a bit of time trying to identify a reverse logistics solution. In the end, he managed to come up with a solution that was uh, cost neutral. And so that was a situation where you had a very clean waste stream that had a value, but it was just spread across a whole bunch of different stores nationally. 
and it needed to be palleted and aggregated and all of those sorts of things. And yet the reverse logistics solution, it, it, it took a lot of work and it ended up costing money, but he was able to cost neutralize it because there was a value in the material. So if, if a company can't find a reverse logistics solution when they've got trucks going all over the place to and from their stores, imagine what it's uh, like if you've got a whole range of different waste streams uh, spread in small amounts across a whole lot of different communities. It's actually really difficult. So if, if a truck, you think, oh, the truck's coming back empty, but actually it's not leaving your particular community empty, it's leaving your community sort of half empty and going to another community and dropping off more stuff. And, and so at what point is it gonna collect material? Is that material gonna be compat compatible with the stuff that's already in the truck? Is their return route gonna be uh, a low cost route or is it gonna be a high cost route because they've gotta to go to a recycling premises and if they've gotta clean out their truck after they've dumped the waste, all of those sorts of things. So we know that there are a whole bunch of barriers. Um, partly it's about information management, uh, but partly it's about just the compatibility of, of waste materials and all those sorts of things. So despite some successful examples, it is a huge um, challenge, but one that we would like to overcome. And we've had some conversations, very interesting conversations, but still no uh, real progress, unfortunately. Uh, in relation to recycling, uh, low uptake of simple technologies such as bailing and crushing due to startup costs, lack of knowledge and opportunities and other barriers. So we identified a bunch of other barriers as well, but that's the one I'd particularly like to focus on at the moment. And, and I'm talking about, um, you know, a, a sort of utopia situation where you can collect stuff and there is just that, that basic equipment in place, like a baler, to make sure that you can um, transport the stuff more efficiently out of there. Uh, it, it seems to be uh, something that resonates when we talk to governments and when we talk to companies, the sorts of brand owners that, that, that produce the material, uh, that they would actually like to see that and think that it's a fair outcome. Uh, in relation to end markets, uh, lack of awareness of opportunities to use recycled content. Uh, there are actually opportunities. There are plenty of things that are made out of plastic. There are plenty of things that are made out of glass uh, and, and paper. Um, but it, it's not always obvious what those opportunities are and how they relate to local areas and how you might actually make them work in local areas given the small scale. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about that a bit later. In relation to capability development, planning and governance, developing and containing local capability so if, if you put any sort of equipment in, how are you gonna maintain that equipment? What happens if it goes bust? Um, do you have um, the right sort of training in place to make sure it's used uh, effectively? All of these sorts of things, particularly if you've got small volumes and it's not being used all that much, how are you gonna do that? Uh, and then barriers to collaboration. So potential partners are based in cities. Uh, and I'm talking about the people who manage product stewardship schemes um, and, and other sorts of programs. They're often based in cities. They don't have the contacts on the ground in, um, in remote and regional areas. So is, is there some opportunity to start to build a, a, a better sort of um, uh, communication network? And these sorts of events uh, help in that regard. Uh, so moving on to opportunities, where do we go from here? So the, the paper that I talked about identified 22 opportunities. And so the idea of creating a, a, a list of opportunities is that um, we can go to organizations that might be interested in working with us to start solving some of, the, some of these problems. and it's a bit of a shopping list, I guess, that we can, we can talk to people about which, which problems resonate with which organizations um, across those five different focus areas. They embody a range of approaches. So there's strategic uh, interventions, and these are the sorts of things that um, when we start talking with people like the Commonwealth government, they're particularly interested in. And so that's, yeah, let's gather data, let's look at the material flow analysis, all of those sorts of things. Let's do a, a, an economic analysis about what sorts of industries might work in what sorts of communities how you might set up a hub and spoke network, all of these sorts of things. Um, the second thing is building on what's already there. And that came through very clearly that there is actually a lot happening uh, and that it's gonna be very difficult to walk in and impose something new. It's much better to work with what's already there and the people that are already trying to do things on the ground. Uh, and then the third thing, uh, and we think that this probably resonates with um, the sorts of things that uh, Rick was talking about this morning, but it's resonated with some of the conversations that we've had with governments as well. Uh, learning by doing, so small scale pilot projects. Uh, one of the challenges is, uh, I, I mentioned three companies this morning that I've had conversations with. I've actually had a convers conversations with a bunch of other different companies. There's a bit of um, a, a, a desire by companies to actually get involved and, and do something and solve the sorts of problems. They don't like seeing their packaging end up as, um, as litter in remote communities. Uh, and they don't like this this, this blind spot that they have in terms of their community reputation and, and these sorts of things. They want something to happen, they just don't know what to do. 
so our feeling is that if we can start with small scale pilot projects, we can actually demonstrate to people that something does actually work and then we can build on it from there. And so that's what we're hoping to do uh, over the next little while. Uh, because I do feel that I've been coming to these sorts of events for quite some time and talking about, oh, let's do something big. Uh, we actually do need to get something happening. And so that's why we're starting to focus on pilot projects and trying to get support to even implement those pilot projects and trying to identify partners to work with. Uh, so what are the opportunities in terms of capability development, planning and governance? Work with regional governance groups to identify and build on successful local and regional appro approaches. So I will be talking with as many people as I can about what you're already doing and whether or not uh, we can help and we, whether we can uh, generate the sorts of funding support that might be needed uh, to assist you to do what you're doing. Uh, in terms of packaging waste collections, uh, so consider the lessons that we've already identified through the paper that we did. Uh, engage brand owners to consider providing collection facilities in remote communities. As I said, in order to do that, we actually need to start demonstrating some progress. And so that's what I, I, I'm aiming to do. But then bigger picture, once we can get a little bit of progress on the ground, uh, then I think that we'll be able to get those brand owners involved. Uh, foster collaboration between product stewardship schemes. Uh, and so, as I mentioned before, the container deposit scheme in the, in the Northern Territory would be a good example. Uh, if, if we can start looking at that and, and thinking what else is compatible with that. Uh, and that also fits with broadening existing collection systems to include other compatible materials. Uh, in, in relation to transportation, um, a, a regional haven't spoke. Uh, process is something that we've we've often looked at and, and is often talked about. There are a few challenges to doing so, but it's a good idea and, and something that we'd like to explore. Uh, and then we've also had um, uh, quite a few conversations with product stewardship organisations or product stewardship organisations about reverse logistics and whether there's an opportunity to conduct a, uh, an analysis of barriers and opportunities for shared transportation, including reverse logistics. Uh, it's one of those things that, as I said, is it's 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 a little bit too big for people. We need to scale it down and identify some smaller way of, of demonstrating uh, that these things might work. There are good examples where it does work. We need to build on those uh, and demonstrate it more strongly. Uh, in terms of recycling, uh, I mentioned before the Holy Grail would be widespread installation of first stage processing equipment such as balers in a whole bunch of different communities to facilitate the more efficient transportation out of there. So you're probably getting a, a, an idea that as we step through the supply chain, we've started to identify what are the problems that, that we think need to be solved. And now our challenge is who are we going to work with as we go about solving those problems uh, and building on the examples where people have already started solving those problems in a very small way. Opportunities in, in relation to end markets. So if you work with a program like Red Cycle, for example, which collects soft plastics uh, out of, re out of um, supermarkets, uh, they require, because soft, soft plastics are very expensive to recycle and turn into anything useful, they require somebody to purchase those materials back at end of life. And so Coles and Woolworths are able to participate in that program because they actually buy stuff like benches and uh, in-store infrastructure for, for plastic bags and those sorts of things made out of recycled plastics. Uh, in relation to uh, Red Cycle and an another program called Plastic Police, they, they use a company called Replays in uh, Albury that makes a whole bunch of stuff for supermarkets and, and small scale infrastructure. Uh, they use a company called uh, Close the Loop, which makes an engineered product that's um, it's, it's, mix, it's a mixture of different pl uh, plastics, uh, a very highly engineered product that's used by Downer in road surfacing. And I know that there's a bit of skepticism uh, about putting um, uh, soft plastics into roads. There are two different ways of putting soft plastics into roads. One is to just, uh, shred the plastic and put it in as a, some sort of aggregate material. We don't think that that's a suitable approach. Uh, the way that Downer does it, and there's a couple of other companies as well, there's Borrell and John Holland, uh, they actually use it as a substitute for uh, the petrochemicals that, that normally go into road making. Uh, and so there's this thing, polymer modified binding that's become the sort of standard in, in asphalt manufacture. They're basically replacing the, the, the virgin polymer with recycled polymer. And so you don't actually get lumps of plastic. What you get is a liquid going into the, into the road construction process. Uh, in order to encourage that to be used more widely, um, there are two processes happening. One is Austroads has uh, engaged RMIT University in Melbourne uh, to develop a standard that will be used for uh, high, high traffic roads, um, particularly state government funded roads, uh, for example. Uh, to set a standard so that we can get rid of that stupid process of putting 
flaked plastics in the roads and only use the really good process. Because if we don't have a standard in place, uh, there are plenty of local governments around the country that are not willing to use it, and that's fair enough. Uh, but there, it also provides the scope for the dodgy brothers version of road making, and, and that can bring the reputation of the industry down. So there are two processes, Austroads working with RMIT, uh, and then the industry, uh, Downer and the others, are working with the Australian Roads Research Board uh, to develop a specification uh, which will be more suitable for low traffic roads. Uh, and we think that would be particularly of interest to local governments. Uh, so that's just one of those end market opportunities for soft plastics. Um, but as I said, to participate in the Red Cycle program, you need to have an end market. Our view is that that's not really going to be um, feasible uh, for remote and regional areas where you may not have a local end market. And so what we were interested in uh, talking with state governments and larger local governments about is procurement on a regional basis. Uh, so you have one large procurement that covers a wide range of areas. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about a theoretical project model. So um, we are talking with some potential funding agencies, private sector and government agencies, about potentially funding just the, beginning is, the beginnings of pilot projects uh, in this space. Um, and this is where we're interested to talk with potential partners in the Northern Territory. Uh, and as I mentioned this morning, the Commonwealth can fund projects in the Northern Territory where it's a little bit more difficult for them to fund projects in other areas. So a theoretical project model, and this is just very flexible and, and very happy to talk with people about it, uh, but it's sort of been developed for conversations with potential funding agencies about the sorts of problems that we need to solve. So working through, uh, it, it's basically one table, but I've broken it into two to fit on to the page here with the activities down the left-hand side and the inputs that we need uh, on the right-hand side in each case. Uh, and it goes through collection, transportation, uh, and this is an example of bailing of soft plastics and cardboard. So we're envisaging pilot projects where we know that soft plastics need to be collected. They're a, a, a major component of litter, and we know that cardboard needs to be collected as well. It's a relatively easy material to recycle. Even though it's easy to recycle, there's still about half a million tonnes a year go to landfill in Australia each year, and we want to stop that as much as we can. So both of those products can be bailed uh, using the same equipment and transported out using the same transportation solution. So in order to make it happen, we need to collect and it's got to be source separated. So we've got to work with communities. We've got to provide uh, education, signage, uh, site management procedures and record keeping and all of these sorts of things. Uh, we've got to transport. So we need to work out who's going to be the transport logistics partners and operators in each case. Uh, it's all got to be coordinated. So you don't end up with stockpiles in some area where um, it's not being transported. You've got to have procedures and record keeping in place. Uh, it's got to be bailed somewhere. So you've got to start, find a site suitable for housing and operation of, bailage, uh, of, of a baler and storage of the waste. But you've got to actually buy and install the baler. And so that's where we're looking for funding to support these sorts of projects. You've got to be able to maintain and operate and, and manage the site uh, and have procedures and record keeping and health and safety and all of those sorts of things as well. And then transportation of bailed cardboard and soft plastics to secondary processing facilities or a collection hub for onward um, transportation. Again, you've got to go through the transport and logistics. Where we're going to find reverse logistics solutions and these sorts of things. There is a very good case study in our paper about this happening in the APY lands, which uses a reverse logistics, toll logistics uh, provider. Um, coordination procedures, record keeping, all of these sorts of things. And you've got to have agreements with the, with the processes in place. Uh, and in the, in the APY lands case study, that's in, in South Australia. And they've told us that they're very happy to take more material as well. And so that could potentially come from the Northern Territory. Then you've got to have recycling and end marks, market solutions for cardboard and soft plastics. Relatively easy for cardboard because it's very recyclable, relatively easy compared to soft plastics. But with soft plastics, you've got to have some sort of agreement to procure that material back, some sort of end place for it to go. Uh, and then we've got a report. Uh, if we're talking with government agencies, agencies, for example, what they would want out of pilot projects is basically the, uh, the development of a model that would be applicable uh, across other areas as well. And so they'd want a, a report on what worked, what didn't work, uh, what the outcomes were, uh, what lessons need to be learned and applied. Uh, and then we need to have some way of, of promulgating that around the country so that people can learn from that and, and, and governments would get value for their money. So at the moment, as I say, theoretical project model uh, but we are talking with people about the opportunity to get funding to implement projects along these lines, and we're very happy to talk with people uh, about which councils might be able to host these sorts of projects. If this particular model doesn't work well, but you're a fantastic council that would be great for us to work with, then uh, we'd be very flexible to work in with whatever it is that, you, that you're doing and where we can add value to what you're doing.
so next steps, um, emerging partnerships project, blah, blah, blah. Keep up to date with our newsletter. Do get in touch and thanks very much. Great to be here.